chapter 32. We're going to begin at verse 1. We'll only be reading 14 verses. And I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand with me in honor and reverence of the reading of God's Word. Amen. Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. And the Word of our God declares, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up! Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is to come of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make a great nation of thee. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why? Why dost thou thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did, the, did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fiery wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Amen. Exodus 32, 1 through 14. I'm going to speak to you for a little while today on the topic of getting Egypt out of the slave. Amen. To hear me, getting Egypt out of the slave. Would you pray with me? Master, we love you so much, and we're so grateful for the wonderful presence of God that we have felt in this place today. And Lord, we're just asking right now, as the bread of life is about to be broken for the edification of your saints, we ask, God, that your anointing would rest upon every word. God, allow your spirit to reside upon me and within me this hour. God, that I might declare boldly and clearly everything that you would have me to declare. Let not one important point go missed. But rather, God, let everything be spoken that needs to be spoken, that your people might receive strength and encouragement in their soul to keep on keeping on for you. For, Master, we ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> it is so interesting how wonderful something can look 
when it first is presented to you. I'm sure that the children of Israel thought that the journey through the wilderness to the promised land was going to take a whole lot less time. It was going to be a whole lot less problematic when he spoke to them while they were yet captive in the land of Egypt. And God went to great lengths to secure their liberty. He went to great lengths bringing plates down upon the land of Egypt in order that the Egyptians would not only be willing to let the people of Israel go, but would be glad to see them go. <laughs> Amen. You see, when God does it, Emily, He knows what He's doing. Sometimes we get in such a hurry, we want to do it our way. God said, no, I don't want them to be willing for you to go. I want them to be Glad to see you go. So glad, in fact, that the Egyptians began to heap upon the Israelites all kinds of jewels, all kinds of gold, and all kinds of instruments made of precious metal. They said, here is a gift, take it, but just go. Amen. That's what they did. For how do you think these Israelites in the wilderness could create a molten calf out of the gold that was in their ears. They were slaves. They didn't have any gold. Do you hear me now? They didn't have any tools to contribute to such a project. How did they get it? It was from the Egyptians keeping it upon them. But what was God's purpose for that gold? What was God's purpose for those earrings, sister? What was God's purpose for that ring, mister? God's purpose was to build the tabernacle of the Most High God, hallelujah, to create the very ark of the covenant that would, re that would represent the sitting place or the resting place of Jehovah God Almighty himself. And yet when things didn't quite look so good, and they didn't know what had happened to Moses up in that mountain, all of a sudden, they were ready to go back. But now after you've left people that you've plundered, <laughs> amen, after you've done strip people dry and left them, Complaining, we don't want to be your slaves anymore. Nanny, 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 we're going to be free. We're going to serve our God in Canaan. How do you go back after an experience like that? How do you go back after Pharaoh's army chased you into the middle of the riverbed of, of, of the great Red Sea and then was washed away by walls of water as God released his hold? and cause them to be drowned. How do you go back after an experience like that? Well, if I go back, I tell you what, I better I better be I better have something in hand. Amen. I, I better I better go back with something in hand. Uh, and you know what? It, 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 it better it better be something that really appeals to them. And, and you know what, it, 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 that, that better be something that really appeals to the, to, the, to, the, to the most important side of who they are as a people. Well, you know what we'll do? Emily, we'll just make us a molten calf. Because in Egypt, these are objects of deification. These are idols that are worshipped. You see, the golden calf was not an invention of Aaron's. He was not creating something he had ever seen or heard of. No. Aaron was creating something that he knew existed in Egypt. But he said, if we come back with our tail between our legs and a golden calf in our hands, and we acknowledge to the Egyptians, uh, we're back, but you know what? We decided in the wilderness that we'd rather serve your God than the God we had thought we were going to serve in Canaan. That's what they were doing. We decided we'd rather serve your God than serve the God of Israel. And we proved it by making this image and creating it, and we've offered sacrifices unto it. And you know, just like you people do here in Egypt, we even had a big old orgy and celebrated this new idol that we had created, just the way y'all do. 
In the King James it says they ate and drank and rose up to play. Rose up to play literally is translated that they, they engaged in an orgy. Unbridled sexual conduct all over the place. Everybody didn't care whose wife you were, whose husband you were. It didn't matter. Anybody you wanted. It was a celebration after all. Cracks me up how churches can go so far out of their way to condemn gay lesbian people straight to hell. They, they just go so far out of their way to find some little minuscule place in the Bible where there's something that says something that I can misconstrue to say something that condemns these people, and yet there can be something like this that we're reading about today that's as big as life and all over the place, and it doesn't have a thing in the world to do with, homo with homosexuality or transgenderism. It has to do strictly with sexuality and, dare I say it, heterosexuality. Amen. Well, gee, Mr. Preacher, you don't want to touch this subject matter, do you? No. Why not? Because it might hit home. There's enough preachers out there sleeping with members of their own congregations. Come on now. There's enough preachers out there having affairs with their secretary. Oh, no, it's easy to preach against the homosexual, or it's pre easy to preach against that one, but I'm not going to use this text. I'm not going to speak of this story, because in doing so, I'll condemn myself. <clears throat> you know, children, sometimes... It's not nearly as difficult to get the slave out of Egypt as Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage as it is to get Egypt out of the slave. You hear me today? Sometimes there are those of us that are converted who come into a knowledge of God's truth and yet... If things go bad and experiences are hard and we have a difficult time, the very first thought that comes into our mind is, maybe I'll go back to where I used to be. You hear me today? Amen. Well, maybe I'll just go back to where I used to be. Maybe I'll go back. Maybe I'll go back. Honey, were you happy when you were back there? No, because if you were, you wouldn't be here, would you? Amen. But it's interesting how memory, human memory, can really fail us. You ever notice people always use that phrase that if my memory serves me correctly, you hear people say that all the time, if my memory serves me correctly, this was the case, or they were wearing this, or she said that. If your memory serves you correctly. Because interestingly enough, memory somehow tends to deify the past. I don't care what generations ever lived or died, the oldest of that generation has always looked backwards and said, the good old days. Oh, give me the good old days, right? Grandpa sits there, oh, give me the good old yes, when you had to get up at four in the morning to milk cows in order to have something for breakfast in the morning, and then you had to go to school, and then when you come home, you had to, to plug along behind the plow for five hours, plowing the field, and then you had to come in and help your mother to do the laundry and help do this and this. Oh, yes, yeah, those good old days. How I wish we were back there. But you see, it's so easy in life to look back and see what is behind us as having been a better experience than it really was. You hear me? And I want you to know the devil will use that against you every time. Amen. Oh, yes, he will. Well, when you were back in that organization over there, you never experienced this. Well, of course you didn't, you knucklehead. The, cir the circumstances wouldn't even have been permissible in that situation. And when you were back in that lifestyle over there, you never experienced this. I've got news for you. Life has hardships. Get over it. Amen. Did you hear me? Life has hardships. Get over it. 
Too many people want to serve God and think that everything is going to be wonderful and grandiose and it's just going to glide through life. Everything's going to be, you know, flowery and rosy and nothing's going to go wrong once they come to serve God. No, it doesn't work that way. The Bible said it rains upon the just and the unjust. And then if it starts raining, you and the sinner gal can go outside and both of you are going to get wet. Amen. Neither one of you are shielded from the rain. But now by the same token, if you and she both on the farm, both of your fields are going to get watered. You follow me? So see, on one hand, it looks like it's a negative experience. On the other hand, you're realizing, well, it could be a positive experience, just depending on where you're coming from. But it rains on the just and the unjust. It does not discriminate. And God does not discriminate. He does not hold back bad things from coming into our lives. Now, he'll try to guide us and help us, but I've known so many people that just push his hand away and go on and walk up that path anyway and do what they want to do. And then when all hell fires burning at their feet, they're saying, God, why did you let me go here? Amen. God didn't make you go there. He may have let you go there, but he certainly didn't make you go there, did he? You're the one that made the decision. And that's why it's important, the Bible said, to walk in the Spirit. That we not fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh. Because if we walk in the Spirit, the Spirit of God will lead us in a higher place and in a higher level than the flesh will ever begin to lead you. And your life ultimately will be of a much greater quality. Amen. A much higher quality, a much greater quality than it ever could have been if you'd have followed after every one of your own personal fleshly desires. And every time I use that term, I just know there are people who are thinking, oh, that's speaking of sexual things, isn't it? No, honey, there's so many other things. Your, your flesh has so many desires built into it, it's not even funny. Your flesh is what tells you, I want to live in a hundred moon mansion. I want to drive a Rolls Royce. Your flesh is what tells you, I can't go outside of my house unless I'm wearing Chanel, or I can't go outside of my house unless I've got Calvin Klein on. Amen. So the desires and the lusts of the flesh go way beyond merely our sexual aspect of our humanity. It goes way past that. It involves many other things. And the Bible said they that would be rich fall into a snare. So if your flesh is constantly desiring riches, constantly wanting to be wealthy, constantly wanting to have untold wealth and riches, the scripture tells us that you're headed right to a trap. Because for one thing, people like that tend to do one of two things. They either do something stupid and illegal in an effort to receive what they're, what they're wanting and wind up in jail somewhere. Or they struggle so hard to get something that is not even in the cards for them. It's not even what God has planned for them. So they can struggle and struggle and struggle all they want to, and all you're going to do is make yourself miserable and unhappy because you're striving for something that God doesn't want for you. As my mother cracks me up, she always says, Well, the Lord knows if I was rich that I would just pay off all my kids' bills and I would do this and I would do that. And sometimes I want to say, Mom, how do you know that God doesn't know that if you were rich, that you wouldn't say, you know what, I'm tired of y'all hand picking around me. Go get your own. Amen. I'm tired of y'all mooching off of me. Go get your own. You see, you think you know what reaction you would have to great wealth and riches. You think you know what your reaction would be to a certain situation in life. And yet when that situation comes, holy smokes, all of a sudden, the reaction that it generates is quite different than what you thought it would be, doesn't it? Amen. I'm talking today about getting Egypt 
out of the slave, sometimes it's more comfortable to revert back to what we have known in the past, even though what we have known was far from a happy or comfortable existence. So it was for the people of God. In Moses' absence, they began to long once again for Egypt, for the comforts of Egypt. They created a golden calf, an Egyptian deity, in an effort to make them more at home. And then they began to behave as their captors had, as they had seen their captors, uh, captors behave, conducting wanton orgies in the shadow of this new divine man-made image. Children, I've got news for you. Victory is always ahead. It is never behind. You hear me now? Amen. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what the situation is. I don't care how the devil's coming against your soul. It's not time to look back because it's, it's not in Egypt. It's in looking upward, not backward. Hallelujah. Instead of the children of Israel getting itchy about where Moses was, what they should have done was cast their eyes upward on the mountain and been looking for Moses to come back. Amen. So many times things don't go just right. What do we do? We just turn around and go back to what we used to know, to what used to be comfortable. One of the things that bothers me in ministering to the GLBT communities, one of the things that is so hard about ministering to our community 90% of GLBT people that went to church today, I guarantee, I, I, I believe I'm pretty close on this, on this speculation, okay? I say a good, well, I'll cut it down, let's say 70% of them went to straight churches. Where if the pastor or the people knew about them and who they were, all hell would bust loose. Well, how do you know, Brother Mark? I'll tell you how I know. Because I meet people every day. Do you go to church? I sure do. Where do you go? Oh, I go to Potter's house, P.D. Jake. Woo-hoo, little flaming sissy. But she goes to Potter's house. Well, now, wait a minute. Potter's house isn't an affirming church. Well, but I talked with so-and-so, and they said, basically, don't ask, don't tell. But make sure, whatever you do, make sure your tithe check gets into the offering plate on Sunday morning. You know, that cracks me up, sister, because, Laura, I wouldn't compromise my standard in my church to behave like that. I would not compromise myself as a pastor so that in order to have somebody's check coming into my church, I'd be willing to let somebody in here that behaves and lives contradictory to the Word of God in truth. Amen. Now, they may not define what I've just said the same way I define it. You understand what I've said? But some people say to me, well, you pastor an affirming church. Do you believe anything's wrong? Yes, I do. I believe child molestation is wrong. I believe rape is wrong. I believe a parent having an incestuous relationship with their own child is wrong. Is that okay? Can I say it? Now, guess what? You won't go to very many churches today and hear them preaching on those three things. But I guarantee you can go to churches and find every one of those things in the pews. Do you think I'm going to let a man come to my church that I know is having an incestuous relationship with his daughter just because he puts a good offering in the plate and I'm not going to make a stand on that issue and try to protect that child? all for the sake of that offering. i got news for you, honey. You're wrong. I am going to stand up. But you see, a lot of these big preachers in town, 
As long as you're putting offering in the plate, they don't care if you're the biggest flaming queen in the city. Oh, they'll get up and talk about how that's a lifestyle they don't agree with. They'll get up and talk about how that's a lifestyle that'll send you to hell. They'll get up and talk about all kinds of things. And you know what? A bunch of our community will go to their church and sit there and listen to it. Sunday after Sunday. And write out a check, put it in offering. You know why? It's very easy, friends. It's very easy. Because they agree with them. Amen. They're still stuck in a mindset of self-loathing. They still despise themselves. They still have allowed themselves to believe that they are something that the Bible doesn't say they are and that their own behavior should tell them they are not. How many young gay men come out and they've been taught all their lives that homosexual men are child molesters and then they fear that they may be a child molester simply because they're gay. Have they ever molested a child? No. Have they ever wanted to molest a child? No. Have they ever thought about molesting a child? No. But after all, this is what I've been told that gay men act like. This is what I've been told these people act like. And if I'm one of them, then the potential is there for me, isn't it? You hear me today? And one of the things that troubles me about working in affirming ministry is that I get people who come to our church and I'm trying to preach getting Egypt out of the slaves. Amen. I'm trying to teach getting that wrong, ungodly, unbiblical mindset out of your spirit so that you can go on to serve God in the liberty and the grace of the truth of God. And I'm trying to preach a message that is so powerful and so encouraging and so lifting and so exciting that sometimes I want to stop wings and fly and guess what? They still turn around and go back to a straight church. You know why? Because they haven't gotten Egypt out of the slave. Amen. Do you hear me? Yeah, we left those on today by accident. Normally I put those out. But as long as we don't get Egypt out of the slave, then we'll never be successful removing the slave from Egypt. Amen. You see, we've got to get that self-loathing, self-hatred out of our spirit. Amen. We've got to ask God to help us overcome. Lord Jesus, help me to understand me the way you do. Not the way Jerry Falwell does. Not the way Jimmy Swagger does. Not the way that uh, Kennedy does or any of these others do. Uh, but Lord, I want to understand me the way that you do. And then the Bible said, you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, i got news for you. You've got to have a pretty healthy self-image to be able to love your neighbor like you're supposed to. Because half the folks in our community can't stand themselves. And it's a wonder they beat up on and misabuse and treat, mistreat one another. They're treating one another the way <laughs> that they want to be treated. They're doing exactly what they ought to be doing because that's the way they feel about themselves. But the Spirit of the Lord is saying today, there's nothing to go back to. Get that mindset out of your spirit right now. Whether it be to a lifestyle of sin, whether it be to a religious Conviction that involves legalism and pharisaicalism. Amen. I will say the little leaven, leaven of the whole lump. Doesn't take a whole lot of it, honey. You can live a religious life and still have sin. 
You go into some of these Pentecostal churches where our dear ladies, and I'm not saying all of them are this way because I don't believe they are, but you go into some of them, the ladies got their hair piled on their head and sleeves down here and dresses down to there, and they're so full of pride and arrogance that they can't hardly walk. That's a sin. Got news for you. Do you think you're going to stand up before the Lord? That great day and stand before him with your hair just flowing in the breeze and think that you're going to stand before him so proud of who you are and what you've done. Girlfriend, I've got news for you. You better humble yourself now because if you don't, he'll humble you later. Because my Bible said he's going to burn up every bit of your works and the only thing that's going to remain is stuff that's made out of material that is worthy of remaining. And I got news for you, ladies, with hair down to your ankles. Your hair going to burn right off your head. Amen. I've never seen hair come through a fire, have you? Do you think you're going to stand before God and stand before Him all smug because, oh, I'm so righteous after all, Lord. I've lived like this. I've done like that. The Bible said the Pharisees spoke that way, but then there was this little, this little fellow over here, and he just looked up toward heaven and said, God, be merciful on me, a sinner. The Lord said, which one of those two let the altar justify? It's a little man who acknowledged his sin. You know what? There are churches today that are preaching against us. It's worse here. They don't even like the fact that Jubilee Christian Fellowship meets here. But you know what? We come into church and say, Lord, be merciful upon me, unto me a sinner. And we just approach God honestly and sincerely. And we don't play games and we don't goof around. And we say, we know who we are, Lord, and you know who we are. So, Lord, I'm relying on your grace. Amen. I'm relying on your mercy. That's the only thing that's going to get me into heaven. I'm not even trying to do it any other way. And the Lord's going to turn around and say to some of these churches one day, well, y'all were laughing at that crowd over there. He said, guess which one of y'all went home justified that night. Amen. It was the folks from Jubilee. Once you get started on this path, I'm going to tell you, it's not an easy path. Uh, uh, affirming ministry is not easy at all. But children, be careful, because the Lord showed me, the devil is slick, and he will try everything in his power to make you think. But the only way you can be saved is to go back to what you do, to that old legalism, to that old bondage that you had in Egypt. And God said, but you tell them, keep their, keep their eyes straight ahead and never turn around. Amen? Never look back. Because victory is straight ahead. It's never behind you. Would you stand with me? That was a simple message today, wasn't it?